Good morning, folks. Uh, Ron Buchanan coming to you from San Antonio, Texas this morning. Yeah, same place I always come to you every morning. I don't switch around here. It's always San Antonio now. I hope everybody's well. Hope you have the weather that you like wherever you are. I'm not going to say sunny weather because some people prefer winter snowy weather. We're on the Antichrist this morning. Some of this you've heard before, but in a different context, in a different direction, from a different angle, in a different emphasis. And I've always believed, even before I knew that that's how God teaches, that that is the, the right way to teach a particular subject. And then when I got into the Bible and started reading all the repetitions and all the times that God approaches the same thing from different angles, it kind of dawned on me, shoot, I lucked out. That's the way it's easy for me to teach. So, as far as the Antichrist is concerned, he's got one goal. It's very simple in that respect. Not complicated. He wants worship. He wants to control the world. Now, that's not a new thing, this control of the world. You know, that's been in guys' minds ever since Genesis chapter 10, when Nimrod decided he wanted to try to control the world. People have tried it all through the millennium to try and control things the way they, you know, like to. Pharaohs tried it under the Egyptians. The Greeks tried it with Alexander the Great. The Romans tried it with the Caesars. We've seen, you know, Hitler try it. Genghis Khan tried it. I mean, all, all through history, people have tried it. But on a realistic basis, it wasn't really feasible. Yeah, Alexander got a great big portion of Europe and the, the Near East, you know, all to India, basically. Genghis Khan, as far as square mileage is concerned, he conquered more of the surface of the earth than anybody. Genghis Khan in the 12th, 13th century. But world domination on a realistic basis has only been feasible in the last few years. The rise of the internet, computer, global banking, you know, all these worldwide things that we have in place now, it is feasible that somebody could. Whereas, you know, 100 years ago, 200 years ago, uh, we didn't have air traffic the way we do now. We didn't have computers. We didn't have satellites. We didn't have all this stuff that we do now. So for somebody in France, uh, for them to take South America or Greenland or North America, or Southeast Asia, that's a big hunk. That's a big step. But now, with the way technology is set up now, we have instant communication. We have a worldwide net that can control banking, it can control communication, it can control the lights in your house, it can do anything it wants, basically, if somebody controls it. So now, basically, for the, realistically, for the first time in history, we have a technology in place that will enable whoever has the guts, the power, the charisma, the force, whatever term you want to use here, to be able to literally control this world. We've said this before, Satan does not know the time of the rapture. He's just as dumb on that as you and I. Now he can read the signs just as good as you and I. He knows that it's getting close. But since he doesn't know exactly when the rapture is going to take place, he has always throughout history had to have somebody in place referred to as the Antichrist, 
the beast, false prophet. I mean, the, the, end, the names are endless on this guy. So he's always had somebody in place. That's where when you go to a Bible bookstore and you go through a prophecy section or you go through the, you know, the study section and, you know, get out of the self-help stuff and get out of the biography stuff and get into the actual Bible study portions, you're going to find book after book after book after book on the subject of the Antichrist. Well, Hitler was the Antichrist, they say. You're going to find a dozen books on that. Uh, Ronald Reagan was the Antichrist. Bunch of books on that. Uh, Donald Trump was the Antichrist. And all the way down, all through history, you know, people have always had somebody. They thought Nero was the Antichrist. Attila the Hun, Antichrist. Genghis Khan, the Antichrist. These guys, they may have been candidates for that, but they never got, you know, they never got the title. Because the rapture hadn't occurred yet. And the the devil doesn't know the time of the rapture. So he's always had somebody in place. And the reason he has to have somebody in place is because when we get to the tail end, when the rapture hits, from the rapture till the second coming of Christ, is roughly seven years, seven years plus, you know, a few months or so maybe in there. But he doesn't have a lot of wiggle room. He can't say, oh, good grief, there's a rapture. Wow, I gotta get busy. I gotta find some girl. I've got to impregnate her. I've got to get the Antichrist going. I've got to groom this kid. I, I've got to, you know, train him and so on and so forth. He doesn't have that kind of time frame. So if the rapture is going to happen in the next 15 minutes, he's got a guy that's already ready to go. You know, he's 25, 30 years old or so in there, early 30s. He's already educated. He's already committed. He's already in Satan's pocket. He might not be aware of it. He might not know it. But he will not be activated, basically. That switch won't be flicked until the rapture. So Satan always has to have somebody in place ready to go. The Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God, the Holy Spirit. You've heard me say this a thousand times. I can't explain the Trinity. Yeah, you know, I can give you little illustrations about a basketball. You know, you got the outer, outer covering, covering, and you got the little inner tube part, and then you got the air inside. You know, three separate entities comp comprising one ball, for instance. Yeah, that's, that's, that's God right there. Now, it's so much more complicated than that. There are certain things that we, as human beings, are able to get our heads around. Other things, they're just beyond us. So God doesn't, he doesn't have 12 chapters on explaining the Trinity. He doesn't have 12 verses on explaining the Trinity. He's got maybe two or three verses that directly mention that there is a Trinity, but that's about it. Just mentioned in passing. Because there are certain concepts that we can't get our heads around. It's as simple as that. And you might think that you're pretty hot when it comes to telecommunications or computers or iPhones or iPads or whatever the whole thing is. That, you know, you can control everything in your house just by talking to Siri and so forth. No, no, no. When we get to the subject of God, it's a whole different level now. And within the Godhead, God doesn't even bother to try to explain himself on that one. He just says, it is, take it or leave it, basically. Satan also, in his attempt to copy God in every single thing that he does, there is a satanic trinity. There is Satan, there's the Antichrist, and there's the false prophet. Three separate entities. But at some point, the three separate entities will merge into one, basically. 
But that won't happen until the switch is flipped and the rapture takes place and we get way into the tribulation period. Look in Philippians, oh yeah, Philippians chapter two, start to head there. There's another strange thing about the Trinity. And that is the three persons of the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. God the Father and God the Holy Spirit direct all worship to Jesus Christ, the second person of the Trinity. And we know that by, for instance, look over in Philippians chapter 2, beginning in verse uh, 6. Who, in the context here is Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore, God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So God has directed all worship to the Son. You think, well, that's pretty nice of him. I mean, he could be, you know, sucking it all up for himself, you know, God the Father. Hey, uh, the, the, the dad is always, you know, greater than the son as such. You know, he's been around longer. Uh, he's stronger, uh, he's more experienced. And see, that's why he doesn't bother to explain any of these things because when you get into the aspect of the Trinity, there is no such thing. One more powerful, uh, one smarter, one been here longer and so forth. It is, it's beyond us. But we do know that he does direct all worship to the Son. Strange as it may seem, Satan does the same thing. He will direct all worship to the Antichrist until at the very, very tail end when he just, you know, rips off the mask and he says, hi folks, it's me. And it's been me all along. But as far as appearance and as far as demeanor and as far as uh, lip service and so forth, he's trying to copy God and direct all worship to the Antichrist. And that works pretty good with him till the tail end when he just can't control himself any longer. And his true colors come out. As we saw expressed in Isaiah and in Ezekiel when he says, I'm gonna be just like the most high. I'm gonna put my throne above the stars of God. And when he confronted Jesus there in the wilderness in that 40 day temptation, fall down and worship me, he said. I'll give you all the kingdoms of the world. Just fall down and worship me. So, a quick overview. Once the rapture takes place, all restraints are off. The church is gone. The Holy Spirit is gone. There's no inhibiting power from the Holy Ghost to withstand whatever somebody wants to do on this earth. 
I don't like to paint a grim picture, but I can't paint a grimmer picture than is in the book of Revelation, for instance, when it comes to the tribulation. It's going to be all hell on earth. It's going to be every man for himself. If you're a female, I wouldn't want to be in your shoes for a million dollars. If you're a wimp or a, you know, a gentle type guy or so forth, and everybody's going to walk all over you, I wouldn't want to be in your shoes for a million dollars because all restraints are off. People are going to take advantage of you every way they can, literally. And there's not going to be anybody around. Stop. Call 911. Shoot. They're going to send the address to, to more guys to do you in. It's going to be hell on earth. Now, during that initial time, once the rapture hits, church is gone. Holy Spirit is gone. There's a few things that take place initially. Number one, Ezekiel 37, 38, and 39 kick in. There are certain things that the Jews are going to have to do in the middle of the tribulation. But right now, with the political system in the world and the way the world is set up, anti-Semitism on the rise, the Muslim problem and so forth that they have, these things are not physically able to take place in the world in which we have now. After the rapture, after the inhibiting power of the Holy Spirit is gone, the Muslims are going to have full, full reign to do whatever they want to do. They hate Israel. Does that make me racist to say that? No, they say that. Destroy Israel, run them into the sea, kill them all. I'm not putting any words in anybody's mouth here. I'm not coloring anything that anybody looks at a coloring book, can't see that they're coloring inside those lines there. The Muslims hate Israel, period. And once the church is gone, because the U.S. now is basically the only inhibiting power that they have from not marching right straight down into Jerusalem and taking the whole kit and caboodle. The beginning of the tribulation, there's going to be a war. The Muslims are going to invade Israel with the help of Russia. When I say Russia, Russia is composed of, you know, what, 40% or so Muslim. The entire southern part of Russia is all Muslim states. And so when the jihad gets going, all those Russian Muslims are all going to come down. The other Muslims in the North Africa, Near East and so forth, they're all going to converge and there's going to be a great big giant war at the beginning of the tribulation. Ezekiel 38 and 39. During this time, now the Bible isn't really, really clear on this aspect of the rise of the Antichrist. He will not be destroyed in this war. In this initial you know, war, this is not the battle of Armageddon that takes place at the end of the tribulation. There's another battle at the beginning of the tribulation that has to do primarily with the Muslims and Israel, not the whole world and Israel. Armageddon at the tail end of this thing, it's going to be the world converging on Israel. Initially, in that first battle, it's going to be the Muslims. God's going to wipe them out from heaven. It won't be the white horse. It won't be Jesus coming down. It won't be the armies in heaven coming down. This will be just God arbitrarily from heaven wiping it out. So now, during this time, the Antichrist is making his move also for world domination. The political scene at the beginning of this tribulation period will be that the world is divided into 10 basic political geo political blocks, B-L-O-C-S, blocks, 10 of them, through flattery, through negotiation, through charisma, through, you know, eloquence, through intimidation, through whatever, 
the Antichrist will take three of those political blocks. Once he has those three in his pocket, the other seven will just give up, capitulate, and give him whatever he wants. So he's home free. One of the first things he's going to do, he's going to make a pact or a treaty with Israel. Because Israel, you can imagine, at this point, is a little bit skittish. I mean, the church is gone. The rapture takes place. And the first thing that happens, somebody's trying to kick their butt and kill them. Well, it doesn't work, but they're still skittish in here. So the Antichrist comes to the rescue. He says, look, I'll make a seven-year peace treaty with you, and I'll make sure that nobody bothers you anymore. All right, way to go. We appreciate it. Thank you very, very much. At that point, the temple in Jerusalem will be rebuilt. You can, read, you can go on, net, uh, on the internet now and read articles that they've already got most all this stuff stockpiled and ready to go. Even down to the, the, the garments that the high priest will wear on the daily sacrifice things. They will reinstitute animal sacrifice. They will reinstitute killing, you know, the lambs and the goats and the sheep and the chickens or whatever they're going to kill. It will be reinstituted. You will have a high priest in Israel. They will revert right back to Old Testament type standards. And the Antichrist will guarantee that. For a seven-year period, and then at the end of that seven years, theoretically, you know, we'll renegotiate and see how we stand and uh, where we're going on this thing. During this time, you remember that one week a few uh, months or so ago, well, we were going on about the physical aspects of the tribulation, the, uh, the natural phenomena, the famines the rivers and the waters turning to blood, the sun and the moon turning dark and so forth. These things will begin to take place in this first period. Not the cataclysmic finish that is going to be, you know, the big giant crescendo that is going to be at the tail end of the tribulation, but the beginnings of these things are going to take place. So the average person sitting here, they know something is up. I mean, they'll know something's up as soon as the rapture hits. They get that. Uh, they know that there's going to be political unstableness and so forth uh, during that initial part right after the rapture. When the Muslims and Russia and so forth are trying to take Israel, they'll get all that. But these things will smooth out. They'll settle out. The Antichrist will rise in power. He'll basically dominate and exert his control over the world. And things will be kind of status quo for a while. But in the meantime, the atmospheric things are going to be visible to everybody. The geological things are going to be vis visible to everybody. So regardless of what the political situation is, the economic situation, any of this other stuff, the average person is going to know without a shadow of doubt that there is something wrong someplace. They might not know how to fix it or, you know, how to tough it out or how bad it's going to get, but they know that something is wrong. So by now, let's move up where we're about roughly in the middle of the tribulation period. Three and a half years plus or minus here. And one day, the Antichrist, he walks into the temple in Jerusalem. No big deal. I'm sure he's done that a hundred times up to this point. Nobody thinks much of it. He might even sit down. Well, he will sit down, but he may have sat down before for whatever reason. I mean, he is the world leader at this point. He is the, the main guy. So he sits on that throne in the temple in Jerusalem. And he makes a, pronounce, a pronouncement one day. Hey, folks, as of right now, 
I'm God. Not Jehovah, not Jesus, who you're still looking for to come one day. I'm God. We're going to stop all the sacrifices that you guys are doing. Like last week I mentioned, yeah, we're going to sacrifice a pig today just to kick off my new inauguration here as the king of the world. I'm going to start, the first thing I'm going to have slaughtered and sacrificed on this altar right here is going to be a pig. Jews are going to go cataclysmic. The world's eyes are going to be opened. And he will proclaim himself as God. And he, at this point, will have the clout to back it up. So after this, a strange thing takes place. Look in Revelation chapter 13. Now, remember, back talking about the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, three in one, and yet three separate entities. Can't figure it out. Doesn't make any sense to us. Philip, one time, talking to Jesus, Jesus going on and on and on about the Father this, the Father that, and the Father this, the Father that. And Philip said, whoa, 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 just a second. Show us the Father. I mean, you're yapping about him all the time. You're praying to him all the time. You're talking about him all the time. Show us the Father. How hard is that? And Jesus looks at him and he says, Philip, have I been so long time with you that you still don't get it? He that has seen me has seen the Father. I and my Father are one. Satan and his little cohorts, the satanic trinity. In Revelation chapter 13, beginning at verse, the last part of verse 2, start there. The dragon That's Satan. The dragon gave him the Antichrist. We'll show these blanks in later here. The dragon gave him his power and his seat as his throne, his authority. And great, great authority. And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death. And his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast. There's some Bible scholars that think that at some point here, that there will be an assassination. And the Antichrist, because he's just a guy, he's not God, as such, that he will get killed, and that Satan will resurrect him. That's why I'm talking about, you know, the wounded unto death and then everything, you know, he comes back to life and all the world is wondering and so forth. So there's some biblical background for that. And some people believe that. And I'm not saying I don't believe that. Verse four, and they worshiped the dragon. That's Satan. Which gave power unto the beast, the Antichrist. So the pecking order in the satanic trinity, they're, they're not all equal. They're all you know up there, but they're not all equal. Like God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, they're all one, but they're separate, but they're all equal. In the satanic trinity, you have the pecking order, Satan on top, Antichrist here, and the false prophet down here. They're not all equal. They worship the dragon which gave power unto the beast, they worshiped the beast, saying, who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? Well, when do we get to chapter 19? Uh, That little question will be solved. 
Verse five, and there was given unto him a mouth, speaking great things and blasphemies. And power was given unto him to continue 40 and two months. That's three and a half years. Jewish calendar is a month is 30 days. It's not 31 here, 28 there, and 29, blah, blah. They're all 30 days in the regular Jewish calendar. So 30 days times three and a half years is 42 months. So it doesn't mean, and it's not saying that he's just starting here because we're in the middle of the tribulation now. It says that he can continue for another three and a half years. He's already been here for three and a half years, getting his uh, base together, getting his uh, authority going, uh, exerting control over the world and so forth. Uh, now, in this condition, he's going to have another three and a half years to go here. Verse six, and he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God. You know, that's, that's pretty hardcore when you think of it. I mean, that takes some guts or unbelievable levels of stupidity. You know, I can cuss somebody out or, you know, I've been cussed out. I've cussed other people out in my life. I've been chewed out. I've been reprimanded. I've been scolded. I got spanked and so forth as a kid. I got grounded, you know, all these things. But the concept of somebody just not being mad at God or being frustrated at God or saying, oh, God, why did you let this happen? Or why did you allow that to take place in my life? Or how come you're making me go through this? That's one level there. We're all subject to that from time to time, being confused as to why God did this or he allowed that. Just go talk to Job sometime and watch that conversation between the two of them. But to actually blaspheme God in his face, that's a whole level of depravity that I, I really can't get my head around. But that's Satan for you. He opened his mouth and blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle. And then the dwell in the, uh, heaven, you're gonna get chewed out and blaspheme because you'll be in heaven at this point. And it was given unto him, the Antichrist, to make war with the saints. That's not you in heaven. That's the saints, the tribulation saints that are here on the earth still. He'll make war against them. He'll kill them by the millions, by the billions. He will kill them. And to overcome them, he's going to beat them. And power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. He's got complete global domination. He runs it all. The things that Alexander the Great and Genghis Khan and Hitler and all these guys only could dream of, he's going to get. Verse 8, and all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from before the foundation of the world. So he'll have complete, total world domination. You've heard about the mark of the beast probably all your life in some form or another, either from a Christian aspect or, you know, the, ooh, 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 you know, he's got the 666 across the forehead. He's got the mark of the beast, uh -huh, uh, you know, in a joking type way. But it's going to be a real thing. From an economic standpoint, he will control the world. As well as a political standpoint, a social standpoint. We can see all these things in the making. You take something like Twitter, for instance. You know, we had that big fight after Elon, you know, bought the thing. Uh, we're going to open up Twitter to everybody. And before that, 
uh, people were yelling and screaming because they were getting shadow banned and they were getting, you know, knocked off and so forth because they were saying things that the, the lords of Twitter did not agree with and so forth. And so they would just take you off arbitrarily. And what power did you have as a single individual person sitting there in your laptop or your notepad or whatever? And days might go by before you even knew that you were shadow banned or that you were taken off. It wasn't until maybe you were talking to one of your friends and so forth, and you say, well, did you see my post here? You see my post? No, I didn't see anything. Oh, really? Well, I posted like crazy. Well, I never seen anything. They just took you off arbitrarily. That kind of control nobody in the world had, you know, 50, 100 years ago. But we do now. So from a social aspect, any dissent, anybody bitching about the, the, the policies of the Antichrist, anybody going against the dictates and the commands of the Antichrist, they're not going to get any worldwide, you know, play. If there's anybody here bitching about it, and there will be people bitching about it, because he's going to have some civil unrest through this whole thing. There's going to be rebellions from time to time. He's going to have to put out fires here, there, and other places. We'll get to that another time. The kings of the east and so forth are going to come through. Another army from the, uh, from the kings of the east, from the east, another army from the north is going to come in. Another army from the south is going to come in. He's going to have troubles all over the place, but he will still be able to dominate. From an economic standpoint, it will be absolute control. What would happen to you on a realistic basis? If right now you're sitting there on your, you know, your iPhone or whatever you use to, you know, make a purchase with PayPal or something, and all of a sudden PayPal doesn't work. And you run down to the ATM, all of a sudden the ATM doesn't work. Now what do you do? Most of us don't even have a checkbook anymore. And if you can't have access to your ATM, and if you can't have access to, you know, getting money out, then you've got a uh, stockpile someplace on the cloud or whatever, what are you going to do? He has got you right where he wants you. And so that's why Revelation tells us that no man can buy or sell unless he has the mark of the beast. That's 666, either across his forehead or in the back of his right hand. These aren't just arbitrary little doodads that, you know, well, you know, I'll grow potatoes. I'll, I'll plant a cherry tree. Really, what are you going to water it with? What are you going to do for sunlight? You remember, we've already looked at the fact that God has messed with the water. The rivers, the fountains, the oceans, the seas, the lakes. Where are you going to go water to go ahead and fertilize and, and uh, irrigate this stuff? The Bible mentions in tribulation that the famine will be so vast and widespread that you won't even be able to realistically think about it. So this cavalier attitude, well, I don't care if I don't have an ATM. You know, I just, uh, I got a garden out of it. Well, it's not going to last you, what, three days? Before the neighbors figure out that you're the only one on the block that's got a garden, and then in 15 minutes, it's gone. So you got a mortgage to pay. You got medical things to take care of. You got food to put on the table. You got lights to put on. Don't think that if you're still here, you're not going to do everything and anything that that guy wants to make sure that that flow keeps on going. Because if you want money to eat, take a mark. You want your electric to stay on so that you can keep in touch on Facebook and the internet and so forth? Take the mark. Do you want to pay for that medical procedure? Take the mark. So all this cavalier attitude, no, 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 yeah, I'll tough it out. At that. Fooey, you're not going to tough anything out. You'll succumb. Where do I sign up? Here, let me 
Let me shine that up a little bit so make it easier for you. It's gonna be hell on earth, folks. Hell on earth. Revelation chapter 13. No, I already read that one. What will take place, what we just looked at here about the, um, the devil coming into them. There will be a literal, oh, that's where I got sidetracked about Philip and Jesus. And Jesus said, he that has seen me has seen the Father. At this point in time, Satan himself will literally come down because there's going to be a war in heaven. Turn back there for a second. Chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12, beginning at verse 7. And there was war in heaven. I, I, I've read this a thousand times. I still, that phrase, I, it just does something to my head. A war in heaven? Are you joking me? I mean, is, is it like some, some big army coming up from the earth, rocket ships and so forth? You know, uh, how many trillions of years is that going to take to make that journey? No, no, no. It's going to be a spiritual war. Michael and his angels, the devil against his angels, because the devil is still in heaven. That's his home right this morning. He's still there. He still has access to God when God beckons in. He still has access to the throne of God if God wants to talk to him. And when he has to report in to God. Make no bones about it. Satan is not, you know, he, he can be here from time to time, but his primary home is still heaven. Until this war takes place. Revelation chapter 12. Verse 7, and there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, Satan. And the dragon fought and his angels and prevailed not. They're going to get their butts kicked. Neither was their place found anymore in heaven. God's going to boot them out. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. That's the middle of the tribulation. That's when the Antichrist sits on that throne. In Israel and says I'm God now folks and at that moment when he gets booted out of heaven Satan he comes in the Antichrist has already been here he's just a man you and me he's been here Satan will literally possess him to the point that he becomes Satan the Antichrist Satan is ticked off. He's just lost the battle in heaven. He's lost his home. He's cast out into the earth. He can read. He knows he's only got three and a half years left. He shall continue for 42 months. He's got three and a half years left. He is not a happy camper. And Jesus refers to that last part of the tribulation as the great tribulation you got the tribulation seven year period but the last three and a half years jesus refers to as the great tribulation that's when the jews are going to get slaughtered by the millions any people who express any hope from jesus christ they're going to get killed and by the way when they get killed, boom, their soul goes right to heaven. They're saved. They're fixed up. There will be people by the millions saved during that tribulation period. You've got the 144,000 sealed 
Jews, 12,000 from each tribe. At the beginning of the tribulation, when the wheels are starting to fall off, these guys are going throughout the world preaching. Church is gone. Holy Spirit is gone. But these guys are still preaching. And so there will be millions of people saved. But there will be billions of people killed. There's, you know, seven and a half, eight billion people on this planet now. The majority of them are going to either get killed by the Antichrist or the Antichrist and his bunch are going to get killed by the Lord when he comes back. So after that last, at the tail end of that three and a half great tribulation period, in Revelation chapter 19, beginning at verse 11, this is one of my favorite type things. I love the, the good endings because it can get depressing up to a point like this. But God doesn't leave us hanging. Revelation 19, verse 11. And I saw heaven opened. Behold, a white horse. This is not the white horse from Revelation chapter 6. This is a different white horse. And he that sat upon him was called faithful and true. And in righteousness, he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire. And on his head were many crowns. The first one back in Revelation 6 is had a crown, not many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. And his name is called the Word of God. That capital W flips you right back to John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word, capital W. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. All things were made by him. And without him was not anything made that was made. This is Jesus sitting here, verse 14. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. That's us, folks. We went up in the rapture. We had that seven-year period up there with him in heaven. And now when he comes back, a clean house at the tail end of the tribulation, boom, we're back with him. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on, hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords, all capitals. You don't get any bigger and any higher than that. So Satan's final ultimate demise, yeah, it's coming. Look in verse 19, same chapter, 1919. And I saw the beast, the Antichrist, and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse. And against his army. And the beast was taken. And with him, the false prophet. We haven't really gotten into the false prophet. We'll do that another time here. With him, the false prophet that wrought miracles before him. With which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast. And them that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into a lake of fire burning with brimstone. That is the end of the Antichrist. Satan is mentioned later on. Satan is going to, you know, get thrown in the bottomless pit for a thousand years. He'll get out of the bottomless pit. He will once again go through the world, stirring up rebellion and so forth, and get everybody all cranked up. He will have an ultimate rebellion against God. And again, God will just snap him out. And he himself will be cast alive into the lake of fire, which burns forever and ever. 
And you say, wow, are we done for the last days? Not by a long shot. We haven't got through the, uh, the millennium. We haven't got to New Jerusalem. We haven't got to a new heaven and a new earth. We, there's tons of stuff here. So don't, don't despair. Uh, we did end up on a good note here. The beast gets his just rewards. And we'll get our just rewards. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for this book. I want to thank you. You worked all this stuff out a trillion years ago or so. Now we're, we, we we're watching it play out in real time. But through your job description as God, you saw all this stuff. You saw every innuendo. You saw every conceivable condition, all the parameters, all the what ifs, all the how comes, every single scenario that you can play this out with. You've seen it. Nothing catches you by surprise. And you were nice enough to us to just kind of loosely, simply, uncomplicated wise, put it down in paper for us so that we don't have to despair. I'm not worried at all about the end of the world. I'm not worried at all about the rapture. I'm not worried if I'm saved or if you're strong enough to keep my salvation or if I've blown it today or blew it yesterday and, oh, i got to get saved all over again. None of that junk do I worry about. I don't worry about the Antichrist. I don't worry about Satan. I don't worry about the Internet and the worldwide control. I don't worry about the international banking system that says, you know, uh, that I can use my ATM or not use my ATM or a PayPal or not. I don't worry about any of that junk. Because I know how the book ends. And it ends simply that every mouth shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Every knee shall bow and confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The future does not bother me at all. Oh, yeah, I wish I was in better health. Yeah, I wish I had, you know, access to more things or whatever. That's just the flesh talking. But at the end of the day, I sleep really, really good in that sense. That I don't worry about you. I don't worry about your ability to do what you promised to do. I don't worry about the fact that, oh, Satan's got a curveball that he's ready to throw at you that you didn't see coming. And how are you going to react? None of that, John. You are Lord. King of kings. Lord of lords. All in capital letters. And I bow before you this day. And thank you in Jesus' name.